Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from extraordinary women in sport. I'm Sue Anstis, a founding trustee of the Women's Sport Trust charity and the founder of Fearless Women, a company with a powerful ambition to drive positive change for women's sport. I'm so grateful to Barclays for once again choosing to sponsor this series of The Game Changers, which will focus on fearless women in football. In each of the eight episodes, I'll be talking to a trailblazer, reinforcing Barclays' huge commitment to the beautiful game. Last year, Barclays announced the biggest ever sponsorship of women's sport in the UK as the Barclays FAWSL became Europe's first fully professional women's football league. A huge amount of their investment also went into establishing the Girls Football School Partnerships with the aim of ensuring that all girls in England will have equal access to play football in schools by 2024. My guest today is Moya Dodd, one of the most influential women in global sport. Former vice captain of the Australian women's football team, Moya served on the board of Football Federation Australia and Asian football's governing body before she became one of the first women to join the FIFA Council, where she took a lead role on gender reform. Moya still sits on a FIFA committee along with the IOC Athletes Entourage Commission. She's Honorary President of Women in Sports Law, Chair of Common Goal and serves on the board of Barefoot to Boots. I began by asking Moya about her earliest memories of football. I grew up in Adelaide in Australia where football was Australian rules football and I did play that as a kid at school. Unfortunately I never played in a proper team because girls were not allowed in the teams and even kicking around with the boys on the oval I usually got kicked off because They had a thing about there being girls' day on the oval and boys' day on the oval. And unfortunately, that meant that there was no lunchtime in which I could kick around with the boys. I would have a mad 15 minutes of morning recess where I would kick around with the boys. But that was it, unfortunately. And it was a pity because I really loved kicking. And then um, actually a friend moved from interstate, a boy moved to the school, and he, he liked to kick a round ball. And we didn't actually have one at the school. So we looked in the sports shed and we found a flat basketball and we kicked that around for a bit and I really could not see the attraction at all. (laughs) (laughs) And it wasn't until my family got a television when I was 10 or 11 that I I actually first saw football. And I just thought it was marvellous. I was just really quite captivated by, by everything, by the movement of the ball, the movement of the players, the atmosphere, the crowd, the whole sense of a team sport that was yet so individual. You know, it's a game where individual performance is so important and yet no individual can do anything without the rest of their team. So it's as if it's perfectly balanced between a collective effort and an individual effort. And, you know, like like billions of other people, I just fell in love with it. And were there other girls playing at all, playing football with you? No, no. Uh, It wasn't until a few years later, I was 13, when... I found a team. I mean, I started following the game madly. I would kick the ball against the wall at home until the neighbours complained and I would read the paper every day and see what news there was of football. I also discovered shortwave radio because uh, my dad was a bit of a aeroplane buff and he would listen to, you know, the airport signals and strange things like that. So there was this shortwave radio in the house and I discovered I could pick up the BBC World Service. So I would actually take that to bed and I would sort of hide it in my bedroom on a Saturday night and then be listening to the three o'clock kickoff, you know, close to midnight in uh, Adelaide and listen in on actual live, you know, live from Anfield, live from Wembley. It was just so exciting. But then I eventually found um, some some scores in the newspaper for a women's soccer league. So I uh, pedalled off on my bike and joined up with the Port Adelaide Soccer Club and, you know, it was just a whole new world opening to me. You lived in a, in a fire station. Is that the true things I hear about you? That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, that was my first home, and I lived there till I was 10. My dad was a fireman, so uh, he was the superintendent at that fire station, and he later worked at the Central City Fire Station, but we still lived in Woodville Fire Station. Actually, it wasn't until recently that it occurred to me that my backyard was full of men in uniforms, you know, bantering and swearing and carrying on. And I suppose that wasn't a bad thing to get used to if you're going to be in football because it never intimidated me. You mentioned that you've kind of found a woman's team. Where did that take you from there? 
Um, yeah, so women's football was very small in Adelaide then. I think there were six teams in the whole city, a city of a million people. And the club had one team. Of course, there was no kids' football, there was no youth football, there was just a, a team for women. And we all mucked in in the same team. I think I was the youngest, but there were some who were oof, in their 20s. You know, they were so old. One of them even had a, a husband and a child. <laughs> and, you know, the older ones drank beer and smoked cigarettes and swore and and so on. I thought it was all marvellous. It was just, I I loved it. I mean, it was, (laughs) you walked down onto that field and there were, you know, there were real goals and and, and nets and teammates and you could just try and do all the things that that you'd seen on television, really. And do you think if AFL had had the presence it has now when you were growing up that you may have played more Aussie rules football rather than traditional soccer? Well, I might have, I might well have because that was the first sort of football that I kicked and, yeah. you know, it was just never offered to me. So I found something else. And I, and I do think that AFL has been very slow to do things for women. I and mean, it's the richest sport in Australia. And it wasn't until 2017 that they began a national league. You know, FIFA held a world tournament in 1988. So it was 29 years after Set Blatter that the Australian Rules Football League held a tournament at the top level of its organisation. So I think it's a shame. I mean, there are a lot of women of my generation for whom football just was not an option, football of any code. You know, soccer was more complicated because Australia had had a wave of post-war European migration. So the teams that existed were largely built around social clubs for the various ethnicised groups. So, you know, there was the Italian team called Adelaide Juventus and there was the Greek team called West Adelaide Hellas. And, you know, all of these teams sort of might be a natural place for you to play if you belong to that ethnic grouping. But, you know, I was a half Chinese kid who lived in a fire station. I didn't really belong to any of those groups. Football was a a sport for for migrants, for sort of ethnicised groupings, and they were at the margins of mainstream sport that was not well covered in the newspapers. It was very uh, it, it was very demonised actually, and then of course women in that environment were not exactly promoted by those clubs. They had their own museum culture, where the idealised society for someone who'd migrated from. Greece in the 50s was Greece in the 50s, you know, didn't involve women playing football. Those times and those cultures were were still being seen as the ideal in football clubs in Australia 20 or 30 years after their own home countries had moved on to become much more progressive and accepting of of women's role in broader society. So, you know, really, (laughs) it was kind of a miracle that I made it at all into football (laughs) Absolutely nothing in my my background. I mean, no one in my family played football. It was just something that I I found for myself, or it found me, I suppose. And were your family supportive of it? Your parents supportive of your your football all the time? Yeah, they were. Um, I think they were a little worried at, at, at different phases when I got so sort of obsessed about it that maybe I wasn't doing other things in my life that I should have, like my homework. I was very lucky to be born in the family I was. I've, I think as you get older, you realise more and more not only what your parents uh, sacrificed for you, but what they created for us. I mean, my mum was a full blood Chinese, born in Australia. She was a Seventh Day Adventist, so we were almost completely vegetarian. My father had grown up during the Depression. His father died when he was young. He'd had a very tough childhood. And he actually became an acrobat. He was a professional acrobat for a few years. You know, here we were, this, you know, these half Chinese kids living in a fire station, going to church every Saturday, taking vegetarian lunch boxes to school, you know, mixing it with a fireman in the backyard. It wasn't odd to me, but I knew that we were different. But I was very lucky that my parents never let us feel like we were second rate. I grew up thinking we were special, actually. They just let us grow up thinking we were special. And it also meant that. I didn't feel like I was under pressure to impress or please anyone else other than myself and the people who mattered to me. So, you know, these were probably good things to learn as a child if you get, if you want to play football in later life. A yeah, foundation for, for other challenges in life too. And, and so that journey from a young girl kicking off the deflated basketball, as it were, to um, pl- eventually playing for your country. So how old were you when you got your first cap for the national team? 
I was 19, nearly 20, when I first played for the national team. And they weren't the Matildas there, were they? No, we were called all sorts of things. Oh, my God. We were called um, <laughs> the Soccerettes, the Female Socceroos, all sorts of strange names would pop up in the newspaper. It, it's sort of nice now that people are impressed that you used to be in the Matildas. But I can tell you that at the time, people were more puzzled than impressed. I mean, they would just kind of look at you strangely as if you're a bit of a circus freak and say, oh, didn't know girls played soccer or I, I didn't know we had a national team. And that was about it. So really you weren't playing to please anyone else or because you were going to be rich or famous. You were just playing because you wanted to be as good as you could be and this was the pinnacle of the possibilities that were open to you. And at the time, do you think you ever, as players, resented the fact that there wasn't that profile or money opportunity in the women's game? I think we did, but we didn't pause on it for long because there wasn't it wasn't very productive, you know, and and when you're an athlete, you're very focused on yourself, frankly. I mean, you have to be a bit selfish about it. You have to say, well, you know, even if it's your best friend, I'm sorry, I'm not coming to your birthday party because I have a big match the following day. And, you know, you, you do put aside a lot of other things and it's all because you want to optimise your own performance. Um, you want to eat right, you, you train right. You have to be very singular and very focused if you want to be the best at something. So that doesn't leave a lot of room for belly aching about what's not there. You know, you really have to get on with what is there. At the same time, though, many of us were involved in administering the game or, you know, making things happen from quite an early stage. I mean, I was just at university. I was, I was still a teenager when I was on the management committee of my state federation. And my job was to be the publicity officer, which basically meant sitting by the phone every Sunday night while I ate my dinner and people would phone the scores through from the day and I would collate them all and then ring them through to the newspaper. You know, I knew how important it was to get those scores in the newspaper because that's how I'd found the sport. It was a little bit of free publicity that we got every Monday. Might be a couple of column inches and that was all, but that was it. That, that was all we had and we had to service it and we had to you know, put ourselves about. So, you know, many of us were involved in different ways, organising this or that taking a role in either club administration or regional administration from quite early on because we knew we had to build out the platform even as we were still playing on it. And you were studying to be a lawyer at the time. So how did you juggle that timing of, of studying during the day, I guess, and training and playing as well? Well, you know, student life at university back in the uh, 80s was a little different to now. I was enormously lucky. I belonged to the jackpot generation. In Australia and I went through university without paying fees. That meant that I didn't have to work, you know. I mean these days kids are working part-time while they're studying full-time and it's just a lot harder I think. I mean I did have part-time jobs but that was to save up money to play football, to, <laughs> to play representative football. So I, I think being a student and playing for the national team was a lot easier than working actually. I mean once you hit hit the road uh, as a baby lawyer, working back eight nights a week and um, trying to keep up with the, the workload that they, they keep putting on you, that that was really hard. I mean, that was I was just always tired. I remember I had one night the week where I wasn't training and I would work back late to try and catch up on all the things that I hadn't done on, on the other nights when I'd, you know, sneak, snuck off early. And then in 1988, you played in the first FIFA Women's Invitation Tournament in China. What was that experience like? Uh, that was one of the best experiences of my life, actually. I mean, I can't tell you how important it was that FIFA held that tournament. Until then, there were tournaments, but they were they were friendlies. There was no fixed rhythm or calendar to them. You just never know whether they were going to be on or off or actually who you were going to play. I mean, there was a sort of unofficial World Cup that had been held in Taiwan during the 80s a couple of times, and I played in one of those in 87. And, for example, you know, we knew that there were the Germans were coming. We knew that the Italians were coming. But, you know, with the Germans, we didn't know if it was a full national team or if it was going to be like a, you know, a Bavarian regional team or who, or who was going to show up. And you just didn't know until you got there and you sort of looked at their track suits at the opening ceremony and you thought, <laughs> huh, you know, is that, is that the German emblem or is that something else? And I think one of the great travesties of the 20th century Actually, I think the greatest injustice in world sport ever has been the exclusion of women 
from football. We would be living in a different world if the national bodies like the FA and the international bodies like FIFA had taken it upon themselves to allow, to just permit women to go ahead and play and then to create competitions in which they could participate. I mean, we all know how popular football was in the First World War for women. I mean, it, notwithstanding that they probably had no history in playing the game, they got out there and they did a good enough job that 53,000 people showed up to watch them by 1920. And this was as well in the middle of a pandemic, ironically enough, because I hadn't thought enough about the Spanish flu until recently. And I realised that, that actually the Spanish flu followed hot on the heels of the First World War. So while women were absolutely flourishing on the field during the First World War, you then had a pandemic. And then just at the end of that, the FA decided to ban women from playing. And I look at those old black and white photos and, you know, those women in their woolen hats and their leggings and, and you see in the background grandstands full of people. Tens of thousands of people are watching them play. And you think this whole idea that there is no demand to watch women's play sport is the biggest fallacy that has been sold to us. That is not something that occurred naturally. That is something that occurred because of the active suppression and eradication of women from the sporting landscape. There were deliberate measures to exclude us. And then, you know, our grandparents and parents, and we grew up in this world where women didn't really play sport and certainly nobody was interested in watching it. So there was definitely no professional career path there. That was the world that we lived in for pretty much all of the 20th century. And it's taken a 100 years for us to get back to the point where you're seeing, once again, tens of thousands of people in the stadium. I mean, we certainly haven't recovered any kind of position of equality yet. I feel very passionately about this topic right now. I mean, if we do nothing, nothing will happen. Because if women are left behind in the recovery from this pandemic, as they were left behind in the last pandemic, the Spanish flu in 1920, then we will watch men's professional sport accelerate away from us as our grandmothers and great-grandmothers had to do in the early part of last century. And the prospect of catching up, well, it could be another 100 years before we get close. So I really do feel that at this moment it is absolutely critical to hang on tight to those principles of gender equality in sport and to make sure that the usual lame excuses like there's no demand, nobody wants to watch, you're not as good, you're not interested after all, you know, these fallacies that have followed us around for decades, it's so important to pull them apart and and show them up for what they are right now because they cannot be allowed to hold back the progress of women's sport as we come out of this pandemic into a period of recovery. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to go back to, but I do want to continue that conversation, but I'm going to go back to that tournament in China. Do you think at the time you knew how groundbreaking it potentially was? We had a great sense of the moment, or at least I certainly did, and I think, I think our team did. I mean, we had been waiting for so long for there to be an official World Cup. and you know, you would you would be standing by and, and hearing, oh, you know, FIFA might hold a tournament next year and then it wouldn't happen and then maybe they would, you know, there was just no certainty about it. So when it finally happened, there were 12 teams who were invited to China. Uh, Australia was invited and actually I wasn't chosen in the original squad but somebody got injured and I was brought in as a, a, a late replacement. I've thanked that player many times for her dodgy ankles which enabled me to get on the plane to China. <laughs> But, you know, it was it was hugely important. We we knew that it was a pilot. It wasn't called the World Cup, but it was a World Invitational Tournament or something, but it was the nearest thing to a World Cup. In fact, I didn't even really know the term friendly. Apparently all our matches were friendly, as I'm told, but I tell you what, they, they were not friendly. <laughs> I didn't feel like it. Friendly compared to what? There was nothing official. So this was as official as it got. And if we were playing New Zealand or China or somebody, then it was it was serious. This was, you know, you died for it. To know that there was an actual official tournament for Australia to be invited to get a, a spot in the team, it felt like you were there as history was 
being written. And we we all felt, I think, the responsibility to do really well in that tournament, not just to acquit ourselves well for our own selves, for our families, for our teams and all the people that helped us for our country, but also because if we all did well, if all the teams put on a good show and convinced the world that, you know, we were a competition that was worthy of a place, then we hoped that FIFA might actually organise a permanent World Cup. And and that's what happened three years later. And how long after that did you stop playing? When did your career end? My career ended, as many have, with a snap of the cruciate ligament. It was in 1995 for me. It was just before the World Cup in Sweden. It was a few months before that. So I missed out playing in that tournament, although I did finish up going along as the head of administration for the team. So, um, you know, it was not like playing, but it was it was a great experience to be there. And I think anyone who's ever been in or around a team in those big tournaments, you know, you, you get the sense that, these are special moments. They're special days in your lo- in your life, and you you savor every one of them. I was um, studying my MBA then when we were away in Sweden, and I had to do an exam. I remember getting locked in the room by the assistant coach and given an envelope and um, let out a few hours later. You just had to make things fit. You had to make things fit around people's lives and careers, such as they were. In, in fact, a lot of players of my era. I think nearly everybody has, in fact, suffered sort of lifelong economic loss as a result of what they've put into playing, not just because they had to pay to play in representative teams, which, you know, over the course of five or ten-year playing life, it it certainly adds up to a lot, but also because their careers and jobs were interrupted so much. I mean, there were players who they'd want to go to a tournament. You'd have to take time off work. There might be a training camp. You know, if the boss wouldn't give you time off work, people would resign and then they'd go back and they'd have no job and they'd have to find another one. So, you know, trying to stitch together a a career with any sort of advancement, being able to, you know, save for a house or do anything that your your peers were doing was something that was put beyond the reach of many of these foundation players who, you know, let's face it, they were the seed investors in our sport. They were the seed investors. And the only return they've had really is some recognition, which is lovely, from the past. But, you know, that's the kind of investment that I would hope uh, federations and clubs and leagues can now see their way forward to put in because it just can't come from the players themselves and accelerate at anything like the speed it should. And how did you first come to get more involved in terms of football governance with the um, FFA? It was it was my birthday. It was my forty second birthday, and Tom Samani rang me up. He was then the coach of the national team in Australia, and he actually had been coach in an earlier period when I played. So you know, he rang up, and I thought, eh, "This is strange. Does he does he know it's my birthday?" And he didn't. Uh, <laughs> so it wasn't a happy birthday call. I thought, "Why is he ringing me?" You know, he can't. I'm forty two. You know, like I'm sure he's not that hard up for midfielders. He was he was uh, telling me that, you know, the FFA was reconstituting their board and they were looking at candidates and would I be interested in talking to uh, some of the people who were there. So I said, well, uh, uh, I don't know what's involved, maybe. And uh, so I finished up talking to various people and by the end of that week I was in the office of the chair of Football Federation, Frank Lowy who's a very well-known and well-respected businessman here. He was the uh, founder of Westfield. It's kind of rebooting football in Australia after it had gone broke and rebuilding it and was looking for people with football experience and business experience to to join the board. So, you know, my dad used to say it's better to be born lucky than rich. And I think I was lucky, you know. I mean, my my name must have come up somewhere and, and I got a call and that, led me into all sorts of adventures that I had no idea I was going to have. (laughs) And what changes occurred for the women's game in Australia while you were on the board in that time? I think it's come a long way. I mean, when I joined the board, it was 2007. We didn't yet have a W League. Uh, The A League had been rebooted. I mean, I think it was the second year I was there, we got the W League restarted. I remember there being a debate about who the team should be and should they be the institutes of sport in various states or the state federations would play a role in getting teams together or would it be these A-league clubs? And, of course, some of them weren't the slightest bit interested. And eventually we settled on a model where 
the teams would be, I suppose, loosely formed joint ventures between those three entities. At the very minimum, they would use the the club colours and brands of the A-League clubs and the other entities would fill out the sort of sporting uh, requirements and the administrative requirements and and they took different shapes and forms in different states. Some A-League clubs were very good about adopting them and incorporating the women going sort of more and more each year. Others were dreadful and they had to be sort of dragged to it at the end. But I'm glad, and of course there were ownership changes too, which meant that the outlook changed from year to year with some of the clubs. So, you know, those were struggling years, but the W League survived and is now in its, what, 12th, 13th year and is one of the longest standing women's sporting leagues in Australia. So that's something that I think was a big step forward and it laid the foundation for the national team to do a lot better because the gap between city-based club football and national uh, league football was, was big but the step to international football was bigger again. So to, to have a national league that could help be a stepping stone for that was was hugely important. And I think that was the main reason why Australia was able to win the Asian Cup in 2010. It was the first piece of silverware Australia had won since joining the Asian Confederation. And, you know, it was a very soggy night in China with monsoons and penalties at the end. And, you know, we came out on top. So, you know, once again, China's a special place for, for Australians in football. And you also took up a position on the Asian Football Confederation, is it? The executive committee around that time. Yes. How was football different across Asia, for women across Asia at that time? Well, East Asia has always been a very strong region for women in football. Going back to the 70s, I think, there was an Asian Ladies Football Confederation, which I think was not recognised, ever recognised by FIFA. So the games that were played under their auspices unfortunately didn't count for caps uh, and and weren't properly recognised. But there was also an association in Hong Kong, which was started by a woman called Veronica Chan, who is now in her 90s. I think she's still alive. Um, And, you know, it took these champions to make things happen. I mean, by the 80s, Taiwan was quite a force. I think they had decided that, you know, I mean, this is a, a relatively small country overshadowed by a very large neighbour with whom they didn't get along and it was important for them to make their mark on the world and they certainly did. They invested a lot in women's football and they had a very, very good team. China also had a very good team. They were really full-time professionals who were permanently in camp getting better and better and they were really good. I mean, this is the era that produced Sun Wen and, uh, you know, those great players who went on to playing the World Cup final and the Olympic finals throughout the 90s. Mm. So East Asia has always been very strong. Japan was a good team. I mean, we played against them in 1990 over there and they were, in fact, the current coach, Asako, played against us back then. So East Asia has always been very strong. West Asia has been another story completely. I mean, you will find stories and photos of women playing in Iran before the revolution. You'll see old pictures of them, you know, no headscarves, And, you know, Iran is a country that just loves football. But I think the post-revolution approach to women's sport has has set it back a lot, and particularly the exclusion of women from stadiums means that women can't watch top-level football live. And, of course, the the whole issue with the hijab uh, not being allowed on international matches was a a ridiculous constraint, actually. Uh, And it took until... It was 2011, I believe, that Iran played Jordan in an Olympic qualifier towards the London Olympics. Three Jordanian players were wearing the headscarf and the entire Iranian team was, and none of the headscarf players were allowed to participate. So the Iranians effectively forfeited the match to the Jordanians. And by that time, I was chair of women's football in Asia, and this sort of landed on my inbox and I thought, oh, God, you know. And and to be honest, I knew very little about it. I thought, okay, playing in a headscarf, that doesn't sound all that easy. What if you had the ball? What if this? What if that? So I had to get educated on the subject. I mean, I talked to women who did play in the headscarf and got their perspective, but it was pretty clear to me that we had to have a go at doing something about that. And I mean, as you probably know, eventually that rule changed. It took it took two or three years and it took a lot of effort. But there's half a billion or so Muslim women in the world. It's very important that they know that they can play football to the highest level. Yeah. 
I think the progress of the game in Asia has, we've seen real highs. We've seen China and Japan both playing in World Cup finals, Japan winning the World Cup in 2011. We have seen real progress in the rest of Asia where women are able to participate more openly. But at the same time, I think the the degree of some preference in many countries is such that girls are given opportunities to be educated, to play sport, to eat even, second to their brothers. I mean, this is not something that's peculiar to Asia. It's <laughs> there's a degree of some preference all over the world, I think. But, you know, it really is a very powerful and endemic cultural force that keeps girls on the sideline from the very beginning. And if you can't play and, and your brother does, then you lose equity in the game for the rest of your life. Because if you then turn up and you say, oh, I'd like to, I'd like to run the Premier League, they say, oh, well, you know, you haven't played. Um, what have you done in football? Okay, so, so this is a sort of compounding effect that because you didn't play, you're somehow not qualified to be part of the game. And when girls are not given the opportunity to play, this sets them at an enormous disadvantage in any other kind of off-field participation for the rest of their life. That's amazing. I don't know why I haven't really thought of that before. I mean, I guess I'm aware of it in the back of my head, but I hadn't thought of that whole, all those levels of that questioning, what level have you played at? Well, of course, if you've never had the opportunity to play at that level, you never will have done, will you? Um, in 2013, you became one of the first women to join FIFA's very powerful council. Can you just briefly remind us of the extraordinary events and, and I guess scandals really that had defined the organisation a- around that time? Yes, I spent three years on the FIFA Executive Committee, which later became the FIFA Council, and it was a pretty eventful three years, actually. I was co-opted. I didn't win the election. There was an election for one place for a woman in 2013, and I campaigned pretty hard. I put out a policy statement and brochures, and I talked to as many people as I could talk to. I, I came second. Meantime, Seth Blatter had decided that he might that they might co-opt the women who didn't win and then, you know, you'd have three women instead of one and, you know, I think he genuinely thought that would be an improvement. So, again, I got a little bit lucky. Even though I lost the election, I was able to join the executive committee on a one-year term. I had no right to vote but I had all the other rights of a member and it was fascinating, you know. I mean, we were the first three women on that board in 108 years of FIFA. Well, put it this way, you got to see what what it had become, right? You got to go inside that room and see what it had become in those 108 years. And it was fascinating. I mean, one of the first bits of advice I was given by one of the members was that I shouldn't say anything. And to be fair, I I don't think that was because I'm a woman. I think think men who joined had got the same advice, had been given the same advice. Basically, the, the best way to ensure your own political survival was to make yourself a small target, say nothing, just sort of be polite, smile, open doors for people, come, go, don't be a spectacle. And I thought about this and I I thought, God, you know, I haven't come to be one of the first three women in 108 years to not say anything. I mean, it was, they really, you know, I felt it's important that they got used to hearing women's voices in the room after 108 years, you know, to hear a woman speak. So I decided at that point that I would speak at every meeting and um, I would usually pick my topic carefully. You know, you, you can't speak too often or for too long because people will find that annoying and will turn off. But, you know, it really was an environment that was, I think, quite quite unused to having too much diversity of thought. I'll put it that way. I mean, diversity is important to decision making because diverse groups just make better decisions. And it's not just gender diversity that's important. It's it's diversity in many dimensions. But in an organisation that had actively excluded women for so long, I think I felt, felt gender important. Gender diversity was really important. And I hadn't come to sit and be silent. At the same time, you know, I had a long list of things I wanted to be able to achieve or influence. But most of those were things that you couldn't do yourself. So you really needed to persuade others that these were causes or issues that they should be interested in as well. How many people were on the committee at the time that was then the council of your three? How many were in total? At the time, uh, there were 27. So not 30% then, no. A long way short. (laughs) A long way short. 
Yeah, indeed. Can you tell us about the uh, Women in FIFA reform campaign that you initiated, I guess, from asking those initial questions that evolved into something more? Yeah, well, I guess uh, everybody knows that in 2015, things got a little exciting around FIFA in that the hotel we were staying in got raided before dawn by Swiss law enforcement who were acting together with the FBI and the US Department of Justice, which had issued indictments against a number of football officials. And this was just before Congress that year. So the FIFA Congress happens, people from all over the world fly into a central location and, you know, it all kind of leads up to the big day of Congress. And that was an electoral Congress as well. So uh, Sepp Blatter was being challenged by Prince Ali you know, it was uh, it was all sort of it was it was an intense time. One morning, a couple of mornings before Congress was due to be held, there was this raid. It was, of course, world news. It was, I think, wall to wall on most mm-hmm. channels. And you know, there were arrests, there were indictments, and there was a lot of chaos. Really, the election went ahead. Set Platter won again, but you know, there was just this rolling series of crises and scandals that that unfolded for most of the rest of 2015, which caught up, you know, Michelle Platini and and several others. And there was actually a second raid on the hotel later in the year. By this time, there were many voices outside FIFA that were calling for reform. Some had were specific around the vote for the, the World Cup hosting, the vote that had been taken in 2010 that had been won by Russia and Qatar. So there had been, you know, a lot of a lot of noise around this issue, but once you have members of the board being arrested and, you know, dozens of officials being invited, uh, indicted, then it really becomes beyond debate that, <laughs> that you need institutional reform. So a lot of people were talking about it. There were various proposals being thrown around, but it really bothered me that no one was talking about gender balance reforms. They were mostly talking about, you know, good things like financial transparency and term limits and all things that were good good corporate hygiene and good reform proposals. But, you know, I really felt that the lack of gender diversity was a big part of the problem and that reform of that could be a big part of the solution. I mean, we we had a symposium on women's football at the World Cup in Canada. The symposium discussed uh, some of these sorts of matters. We put some motions to them at the end, which they supported as calls to action which were essentially around FIFA being more open to women in decision-making and also fairer in resourcing the women's game. So I I was chair of the Women's Football Task Force in FIFA at that time. I took on the job of holding the pen on this submission. Um, A lot of people had input and and helped, people who knew all about Title IX and how it worked, people who knew all about how female quotas in governance worked. You know, together we put together a short submission which asked the FIFA Reform Committee to take these measures as part of the reforms. And that's kind of where the fun started because, you know, we had a there was a reform committee of a dozen people. There was only one woman on there. That was Sarai Berriman, who's now at FIFA. Gianni Infantino was on there. And there were a range of others. There were quite a few people from the Olympic movement. And we sort of lobbied as much as we could in corridors and by email. But I I really felt that a much more public campaign was needed in order to ensure that these issues were going to get the level of attention they deserved. So, you know, I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times and they published it and I thought, you know, wow, women in football is now something that the New York Times is interested in. You know, they're like the big agenda setter in the world. Others were working on a social media campaign. Uh, A great group called Athlete Ally in the US started a petition and dozens, I think hundreds of Olympic athletes and medalists signed up to this across all sports. Billie Jean King signed on. All kinds of women from the football community started emailing the chair of the reform committee. They were copying me sometimes. So I was seeing all these emails come in, asking that they they listen to the these pleas for reform. You know, I even got a, a, a note from the Minister of Sport in the UK, Tracy Crouch, noting the reform mm-hmm. submission and expressing her interest. So I finished up in Westminster talking about governance reform <laughs> with, with the Minister for Sport. And I was really quite blown away by the amount of public interest and public support that there was for this. And so the proposals did go into the reform package in the end, not as strong as what we had asked for, but nonetheless, 
there's a lot of words now in the FIFA statutes and in the regulations that that are footholds for people who want to argue gender reforms. And they were part of the reform package that eventually got passed in, in February of 2016, which was uh, the same day that Gianni Infantino was elected. Funnily enough, you know, the one of the places where it's had the most effect has been Australia, where there was a bit of a fight about the statutes and the representation in Congress a few years ago. And a local group of football women here called Women On Side entered the debate and started writing to FIFA and saying, hey, you've got, you know, these statutes about gender equality and you need to enforce them in Australia. So the agreement that was struck amongst the stakeholders here was for there to be a 40-40-20 principle on the board in Australia. So that means 40% male, 40% female and 20% any gender. And that is now in the statutes of the FFA. And currently our board is 50-50. And this is all within four years of the FIFA statutes being amended on that day in Zurich. You know, it gives me a measure of faith that making change from the inside is really effective and that there now is a, a foothold for anyone in the world to take hold of and say, this is required to be done, this must be done here, and those arguments can and do win. It does feel like there's this momentum at the moment around change for women in football and we're seeing more players and teams and others using their voices and profiles and platforms and I was going to ask you whether you feel you are more powerful within an organisation and entity or whether more change can be created from those outside it. I love your analogy of the foothold of being inside and creating something that others can then magnify whether it's with social media and campaigns and so on. That's a really good question. I think there are a lot of voices outside. Well, for example, in the FIFA reform process, there are a lot of people throwing bricks at FIFA at that time, and some of them were pretty well-deserved, actually. I I agreed with much of what was being said about FIFA, but it was certainly not helpful for me to say those things publicly because when you're working on the inside, you, you know, you can't throw bricks around when you're on the inside. It's just not helpful. It's not persuasive and it's not effective. And, you know, my benchmark, I suppose, is that, at all times, you want to be effective. So the the rule that I run across things is, is this going to be effective? I think to be effective, you need people working on the inside. Because if you're on the outside, you don't even know where you're aiming half the time. You don't have the, the nuanced understanding of what is malleable and what is, you know, inelastic in an organisation, of who's going to be an ally on, on these issues, who's going to resist, how to address that resistance, what kind of arguments are going to persuade them, what fears do they hold. You know, an insider can have much better chance of getting getting to understand than you can if you're just sort of outside lighting the Molotov cocktails and hurling them over the fence. You know, that's not to say that there is not a place for those loud voices who are demanding of change. And sometimes, to be honest, those who are working on the inside might welcome them because that can assist their argument those sorts of pressures from outside can really help give leverage to those who are working on the inside. I think in my case, I was given an opportunity to work on the inside and I was very conscious that it was a rare and precious opportunity because only three women had got it in 108 years and I didn't want to blow it. So I guess for the first sort of year or so, I was pretty cautious. I mean, I, I, it's not in my nature to speak aggressively against people that I'm talking to. I don't think it's helpful. And I certainly don't think it would have been helpful in that context. But when the crisis hit, that was a moment when I felt it was it was time to put my head above the parapet a little bit higher and, and to be more outspoken on what I felt were the shortcomings of the organisation and what I felt needed to be done to address them. You know, what was really curious about that, and which surprised me, that in effect they they would appropriate that narrative because you have to remember by this time FIFA's leadership had been swept aside and it was being run on a kind of caretaker basis by, you know, the lawyers and the crisis communications people and the accountants. They were quite happy to appropriate my narrative about this gender imbalance not being nearly good enough and improving it would actually assist in helping the organisation be less prone to corruption and other forms of misbehaviour. I had more or less expected to be sidelined and I didn't think that they would hand me the mic and put me in front of a big press conference. 
in Zurich to talk to, you know, all these assembled journalists in, in the big room there. That was the last thing I'd expected. But, you know, when these things happen, you just have to take a chance, I guess. So I did. And somewhat contentiously, you then weren't voted back onto the council in 2017. I think Sports Illustrated called the election a farce and you've been incredibly gracious about that. Is it something you would look to want to be on in the future? Uh, I, look, I don't have any particular plans to revisit that role. I, I do think the electoral system at the moment, not optimal. I think that as a quota in those roles, it's your job to represent people who are not otherwise represented. That's why you have a quota. But I think the electoral system does not really enable that to happen because the same people who vote for, in general terms, all the men are the ones who are selecting the woman who will go to FIFA from that confederation. If you ask the women in football, who are the ones who are supposed to be being represented, who they would like, you might get a different answer but they're not asked. (laughs) You know, I mean, I still maintain a role on one of the subcommittees in FIFA. I do think it's important, as as I said throughout the the whole FIFA crisis. I mean, there were some people who were calling for its abolition. I think football needs a FIFA. I think football needs a strong central governing body because, amongst other things, it redistributes wealth from the top of the professional game, the male professional game in particular, to all parts of the, the football universe. And that's important. That's a role that other entities do not play. I think one of the problems with FIFA was that it, you know, that process lacked integrity. So the money didn't always land where it was supposed to. I'm not saying in any way that that lack of integrity is acceptable or to be defended, but the principle of redistribution is something that is core to what FIFA does. And that is, I think, very important because how else is the neglected or, you know, suffocated corners of the game going to get a start? How are you going to get women's football properly resourced and started in a country where it's had no life? What about disability football? Uh, In professional sport, there's a kind of eat what you kill mentality that I think is, you know, it's very unsociable, actually. (laughs) I think it's very unsociable. I mean, imagine someone trying to argue that in a family, just because, you know, the traditional head of the family, the father, earned all the money in his job, meant that he should sort of eat all the food. I mean, no one would argue that. And I I do see football as it's a a sort of a pyramid. It's an organic pyramid that's intergenerational. And, you know, you, you do need to share the riches and resources of the top of the game with the whole pyramid so that it can flourish and grow. So finally, clearly you've had the most extraordinary impact on the women's game globally. If listeners to this podcast could do two or three things to help drive more change as we sit here today, what what would you recommend? What a good question. You didn't give me any warning of that one either. Okay, so I would say if you're involved in football, you should look around at your club or your, you know, the environment you're in and you should ask two questions. Firstly, you should look at the decision makers. And if you don't see gender balance, you should start asking about why. Because I think many organisations, it's not that they're against it, they just probably haven't thought about it enough. And sometimes it just takes a nudge or a reminder or sharing an example of where something has worked well that will trigger people to realise that they too can capture those sort of gains for their own organisation. So if you're not seeing any women in decision-making roles, then you should start to ask why and start to suggest that that might lead to better decision-making. Because you know what? It always does. Big companies make more money when they have women on the boards. It's weird, but it happens. The second thing I think they should look at is the level of resourcing that goes to men's and boys and goes to women and girls. You know, who gets to use the field, who gets lights, whose coaches get paid or don't get paid, etc. If you see imbalances like that, then again, you should question it because it's not okay in 2020 to continue to suffocate the women's game by refusing to resource it fairly. So those are the two questions I would I would invite people to ask and to look around at their circle of influence. Everybody has a circle of influence, whether it's your family, your friends, your teammates, your your church, your you know whatever your community is. They're the people who you can influence to start to ask some of these questions as well. 
How inspiring is Moya? I could have talked to her all day. I'm incredibly grateful to her for taking the time to share so much of her wisdom and passion. If you're enjoying The Game Changers, it would be brilliant if you could take a moment to review and rate the podcast. These ratings make a massive difference to how the podcast is ranked and how likely other people are to find them. Also makes me really happy to hear that people are enjoying them. Thanks again to Barclays for supporting this series of The Game Changers and helping us to spread the word about these amazing women in football. You can find out more about all the guests from this and the previous series at fearlesswomen.co.uk. Next week, I'll be talking to international footballer turned professional boxer Stacey Copeland, MBE. Banned from boxing as a girl, Stacey played football for England before returning to her first love to win national, European and the Commonwealth title. Sadly, what what actually happened is a parent and coach on the other team obviously realised there was a girl and, you know, shouted across the pitch and insisted that I'd be made to leave. And that that was the first time I realised I was a girl and that it was a thing, like as in a problem. The Game Changers. Fearless women in sport.